my name is Tina Sörre. I am professor of uh, law and economics at the Norwegian School of Economics and responsible for one of the courses, the one on corruption. And I have the pleasure to introduce the first keynote speaker, Professor Kalle Moene. Uh, and uh, Kalle Moene is professor of economics at the University of Oslo, Department of Economics. Um, he is internationally recognized for his research on inequality and development. And uh, Kalle, you will have a speech for us on the political economy of governance and equality, the Nordic lesson. Welcome. And uh, in this, while he, uh, you, you may very well uh, send your questions in the chat your <laughs> corona distance uh, so you may very well send your questions in the chat as we go but we prefer to answer the questions after some 45 minutes or so unless there are clarifying questions we will we will take them right away okay welcome Kalle. thank you uh so I will talk about uh, exactly what the title says, but the title is so wide that, that I can almost speak about uh, anything. But I will emphasize the Nordic lessons, not because we are so super interested in ourselves, but I think they, there are some specific lessons uh, in the sense that the Nordic countries have been outliers. Uh, have been outliers for a while uh, when it comes to participation, when it comes to equality, uh, both in income and, and in, in other respects. It's also an outlier actually in, in the absence of corruption, uh, at least uh, visible corruption. And there are many other things that, that, that make Nordic experience of an, of an interest. It's also interesting since um, there are big changes in the Nordic countries these days from being one of the, I would say, the most uh, egalitarian region in, in the world, there are big changes in particular in, uh, in Sweden, uh, but also in Norway, uh, Denmark and Finland. Uh, <clears throat> but Sweden is, I think is, is, is the clearest example. So that means that many have raised the questions, uh, is uh, social democracy or the Swedish model or the Nordic model, is it dissolving? Uh, and uh, that is an interesting question in itself, in the light, I would say, of the sustainable development goals, because the, in those goals, those, those 17 goals, equality uh, uh, and the fight against poverty was equally important as, as uh, all the others that you know better. If you go back to, uh, to uh, our common future, the UN report that uh, was headed actually by the Norwegian Prime Minister Gro Harlem Brundtland, um, uh, that report uh, emphasized the social sustainability on the equal footing to uh, uh, environmental sustainability or climate uh, prevention of, of climate change. Uh, <clears throat> And, and these things are sort of come a little bit in, in, in the background uh, as it proceeded and coming back again in, in full form. Therefore, I think sort of the, the Nordic uh, experiences, the lessons from, from the Nordic countries um, are valuable also in that context. So my final introductory remark is that learning from other countries, that is not the same as uh, imitating other countries. Learning is, is egalitarian. We can learn for good and bad. We can, uh, we can do prevent mistakes that other countries do. And we can uh, uh, have a much more open discussion of these things. I think there is a tendency in our part of the world to sort of have a, a branding of our, the Scandinavian model and that uh, is, is, is more like a, that it is a role model. Of course, it is not. It is a society model in the sense that it consists of a certain system, a political economy of governance and a political uh, system of power, institutions and typical policies. And I will sort of mention these things as we go along. Um, 
So that is my perspectives on these things. Uh, I hope not to be uh, too bragging uh, about it. There are certain things we can't brag about. Uh, if you like equality, for example, I think this part of the world have been uh, have done remarkable well in reducing, for example, inequality among the major uh, workforce in, in the country. Say that if you extend that uh, concept, you can see the equality between the 99% of the population is remarkable, both in Sweden, Denmark, and, and Norway, and also in Finland, but that came much more recently than uh, in the other countries. Finland has a very specific uh, history that I won't go into, but. Uh, has a civil war between the between the two world wars, for example, that uh, uh, make the starting point less uh, very different from from uh, uh, Scandinavia. Okay, so I will emphasize four things uh, as we go along, and I hope to sort of keep track to these four things. But I will tell you a little bit of details uh, surrounding these four things. Uh, the first of these four things is that. What we can call sort of cutthroat uh, competition easily can generate collaboration of those who are sort of exposed to cutthroat competition. And that means that uh, I will use this to emphasize how globalization or international competitiveness uh, of these countries, they are small open economy that economies that, that uh, have to export 50% of what they produce in the world market, that this competitive situation can generate social reactions that create uh, gradually uh, more equality. Uh, I said that 99% that of the population in Sweden, Norway and Denmark, they have small differences, low level of inequality, uh, but th there is still this uh, top income shares that goes to the richest 1%. Uh, that can be tremendously uh, high or at a comparable level to uh, international other other country other countries internationally. Um, so that uh, so this is the, the first element. I will sort of discuss how how cutthroat competition in in the rural market sort of affects uh, both social organization and governance. Then I will discuss how equality in itself can sort of fuel welfare spending or social policies more generally. They are also of importance for, uh, for the social development uh, goals that, that if you get uh, the basic take I'm going to emphasize there is that if you get some equality, you can easily uh, strengthen it or reinforce it by uh, adjustment of the, the political economy of having a little bit of equality that is that it becomes stronger. That goes both ways. So it, it can be also be dissolved in this gradual piecemeal reforms that where one deregulation can lay the foundation for a new deregulation and so that the whole thing can unravel. So these things that, that things are connected in, uh, in this way, uh, I think is important and of, of general interest. Next, I will sort of emphasize is, is uh, that that become the the uh, the third link. That is how how um, uh, equality in itself sort of spills over to uh, social policies, as I said, and how these social policies allow uh, or make it acceptable to be globalized, that you are competitive in the world market. So I try to connect these things as a full circle. And I sort of claim that for a long time, these arrangements were in a, in a kind of institutional equilibrium uh, where, where, where each aspect sort of strengthened the others. And they were sort of connected in, 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 in a way that they're going to describe as we go along. Let me start with this cutthroat competition, how that generates cooperation and collaboration. Many people think, the, even in this part of the world, that there are something uh, particular or uh, uh, exceptional with uh, Northern European countries. They are more egalitarian from the start and so on. That is completely wrong in my take. We were happy and uh, we had a lucky starting point in, in some aspects. This country, Norway, uh, didn't have this uh, 
uh, feudal properties that uh, big uh, uh, land holdings uh, that, uh, for example, Sweden had. Uh, but there are some details that you had a, a good starting point in some respect. I will also say that we had a good starting point throughout the northern Euro uh, European countries that there was a very low level of corruption in the state administration. That was long before the countries became uh, uh, egalitarian or, or special in that sense. So in, um, as, uh, uh, as I will sort of come, uh, come back to, that, that is important. There are many things you can't do if you have, a, if you have a, a corrupt administration. I think they were happy to have that. I don't think there's something exceptional with, with it. And I think you can find an example of bad policies also in that area. But very often when, when people emphasize Northern European countries, they, it's just as if they emphasize as a requirement for what happened, that we had trust, that we had, uh, uh, that we were homogeneous, that we that we had low uh, inequality in, in from the start on. I think none of these things are, are true. These things are results of the way uh, the countries evolved and not prerequisite for their development. And these things are mixed up. You will see a lot of presentation of these things. And so my, uh, I think one lesson is be skeptical when, when people claim these things, because there are some political aspects of it that, that, that people will like. They, they, they won't like to say that certain things that happened, for example, in the 1930s, that I think is uh, decisive for what happened later on. And some people would sort of uh, tone that down a little bit, so uh, be, maybe because they are not sympathetic to the political change that happened there. But I think we have to be sober and 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 see whether there are clear breaks in the in the, in, the, in, the, in as as thing evolves. And there was a clear break both in Sweden, Denmark, and Norway at least uh, in the 1930s. So what happened in the 1930s? Well. First of all, you have to remember that these countries here had the world record in strikes and lockouts uh, in the interwar period. <clears throat> Nowhere in the world there were so many working days lost due to conflict, as in Sweden and Norway in particular. Also in Denmark had a, uh, had a high level of conflict. And as I mentioned, Finland had a civil war. But, but uh, that is different. But, but this... this uh, uh, there was no acceptance in these countries of a, of a, of a union contract in, in the enterprise. There were lockouts and there were strikes uh, in the whole period. After the Second World War, after 1945, there was a new world record, namely the, S, the, uh, the absence of strikes and lockouts. Nowhere else in the world uh, there was so little conflict in, in between labor and capital. As, as after Second World War. So just to have this as an example, I think it make it very clear that there is a break in the 1930 that is uh, of some interest. I will emphasize one aspect of the break. There are many aspects, but that, that what I'm gonna emphasize, it makes it, uh, uh, I think, more understandable how what I call cutthroat competition generate cooperation between major interests uh, in society. So um, um, what happened was, as, as all you know, uh, world demand declined dramatically. Uh, and that it has the same effect as, a, as just as if there's much more competition to be able to sell in international markets. A crisis has that effect. It's very similar uh, in economic terms and also I think so socially sometimes. As, as, as more fierce competition in the world market. So then you had certain fraction of the Swedish and uh, Norwegian labor market in particular, also in Denmark, that's very clear in, in Sweden and, and, and Norway. But, but it can't, they, it's, it's so parallel that you can tell the story for one country and it's true for both. What, so what happened is that those who worked in the metal, what is called the metal union, that was the biggest union, uh, Jarno Metall in Norwegian, in Swedish is similar. Uh, that union that was very exposed to international competition in the sense that they had what they produced, they had to sell in international markets. So they had to take wage cuts to keep their jobs. There was no way they could prevent that. Uh, if they, if they claim to have the same uh, wage, they will be out of work. 
Then they were afraid that, that uh, unions and workers in, in less exposed industries like uh, construction, that they should get a rise. That meant uh, not only that relative wages became different in between the two major groups uh, in, in the labor force at that time, but also that uh, they were more costly to run exporting industries because they use construction workers for many inputs into the, into the exposed uh, exporting industries uh, in both countries. So therefore, uh, the metal worker tried to control the wage setting of the, of the construction workers, uh, not the easy thing to do. It was a pure, pure conflict between major interests into the big association called LO, both in Sweden and Norway. And, uh, and then uh, it was resolved actually by employers intervening. So they took the side of the metal workers because they like wage cuts uh, wherever it can happen. So they took the side of the metal workers and that means that you got, then you got the muscles or the employers in addition, and then you force the construction workers into life. So I, I won't go into the, all the details of how, how these things happen, but this laid a pattern that you got export-led social development of, of these countries. After the Second World War, then this was institutionalized. Uh, uh, it was called solidarity bargaining. Uh, and the solidarity was that the, 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 you set the pattern in the exporting industries, and that pattern should, uh, should be um, followed by all other uh, sectors. So that means that, you, that the wage setting uh, was ex determined by, by the exposition to international competition, uh, and they tried to have an egalitarian wage structure based on that uh, principle. Normally, for those who are interested in, in uh, union history and so on, normally the word pattern bargaining, that means that you take the most productive industries first, and then you try to raise all the other wages to the high productive sector. This was not what happened here. You took the most exposed workers, and you said that these workers are the most exposed for the whole labor force, so they have to set the wage structure for the whole entire uh, country. True in Sweden, true in, uh, in Norway, true to almost 80% uh, in Denmark, because the biggest union in, in Denmark didn't sort of follow in line. But I, I, I don't take all the details here, but the interesting thing is that this, this cutthroat competition led to some sort of, uh, if you like, uh, class collaboration, a cooperation, first of all, between unions. In the beginning, it was conflictual. In the end, it was something normal with it. And it's still operating, both in Sweden and Norway, strongly so in Norway, not so strong in, in, in Sweden, because Sweden has had dramatic change since the mid-1980s. Uh, but that, this is the, a, a basic foundation that the competition in the international market generated poor operation inside the country. And it's something with the, the, the small openness of, of Scandinavian countries that I think is important in, in this uh, respect. Uh, and of course, uh, some countries are small and open and others are like the US for example, that's a large country, basically a large closed economy because so little of the economy is exposed to international competition. Many people think otherwise about these things, but, but uh, they should think twice and uh, correct their beliefs. Uh, uh, I guess uh, the small open economies are small economies. And since they are small, the scale economies means that they have to be exposed to international competition because in order to have a high enough scale to be efficient, they have to export. They have to serve a bigger market than the domestic market. So this is my first thing that I think this is of some interest both for, for all the sustainable development goals that, that, that this competitive situation can force some, some good, if you, if you dislike competition and you like cooperation, one thing can create the other, uh, even though they seem to be somewhat uh, opposite in, in, in structure. So then you, the, the result in Sweden and Norway was a world, uh, I think, a remarkable compression of wages. First of all, they compressed wages because uh, sectors that were not so exposed to international competition, they had to be in line with the wage development in, in the exporting industries. But it was also that they moved the whole 
the whole discussion of wages into a room of collective decision making. And when you have collective, more or less democratic decision making, that, that in itself compresses uh, differentials. It's very difficult to say you are in the, in the room of collective decisions about wages. They're going to say, and this guy, he's going to get, he's going to get 50 times as much as, we are, as the rest of us. Then, ask, then people will ask, how come? Why should he get so much? And, and you wouldn't have good argument in, in such a situation. But when this is left to the market, then people don't ask these questions because they say there's a strong market forces. But when you move it into a collective decision making, then you have to give principles, you have to give argument, you have to defend the results. And then in itself compresses differentials. We see this in many, many contexts. Uh, uh, also in developing countries, we can see it. I have seen it in India. When you move it, things into collective decision making, you reduce differentials because it's very, it's very difficult to defend these differentials that otherwise uh, uh, arise. So that uh, and the third thing, but by moving, changing the the decision making with, uh, with respect to wages. That is that they, you move the power down in the income distribution. And that is what democracy do in, in, in or participatory uh, processes do, that you, you, then numbers count, how many you are count. Uh, because you can't, really, uh, you can't really neglect a big group. You can neglect maybe a small, tiny group, but you can't neglect a big group. So that means that you move power down in the income distribution where the majority of, of workers uh, are located and you have a, a higher say about that that in itself also compressed wages and you compress wages from both sides it was made wage moderation on the top but you also try to lift the bottom wages how this came about i will return to but what was the consequences of smaller wage uh, differentials less inequality in, in labor earnings well, one major influence was that, that it fueled the political demand for welfare state policies. And here is, I if you just have a warning that, that uh, what I say now is there's not a uniform consensus about this, but uh, again, uh, the others are wrong. Uh, so uh, listen carefully, I only say this once. Um, uh, now this is, this is a very easy explanation for this that many people think that, uh, uh, that when you have a, a welfare state, then you take from the rich and give to the poor. So it's a machinery of, of redistribution. Well, it, it has worked. It, that this was the fear when democracy was introduced uh, 100 years ago uh, or more. This was the, this was the fear uh, among uh, in, in the upper classes, obviously, but also in many sort of scholars that sort of were interested in a more professional manner that they fear that democracy would have that effect. Nowhere in the world have you seen that. What you have when you, when you get voting rights and you get democracy and participatory things, you, you get that people would like to have more social provisions of things that are difficult to acquire uh, in the marketplace. And this is, you see it all over the place that, that when you move into, even in India, small reforms at the local level in India, the first thing they do is to sort of provide social provision. In India, sanitation, very important. As you know, 60% of the Indian population have to uh, have no toilet. They have to go, uh, and when girls for the first time have, have periods, for example, they have to do it in the forest, uh, clean themselves or whatever. And so, so this is a major uh, priority for poor people in India to have some sort of sanitation uh, available. When they got some sort of basic income in an in, in experiment in India, but well, the first thing they did was to, to, to buy that, acquire that. That was the first thing that people thought, oh, they would buy all kinds of luxury things that they never could afford before. The first thing they did was this. And the same is the, is the rise of the welfare state in, in, in many countries. It was the social provision. It, is what, it was what I would call normal good. They are normal in the sense that when you get richer, you would like to have more of them. Social insurance, health provision, education, all these things that was, that was people 
uh, this is what political demand generates. When you compress wages, what do you do then? You raise, say, let me say that again. When you compress wages uh, and you keep the mean constant for the argument now, let the mean be constant, let the average wage be, uh, be constant, but you compress it. Well, what does that mean? That means that the majority, the great majority get higher pay because the mean income, the average income is always above the median income. The median income has 50% of the population on, either, on both sides, 50% richer, 50% poor. The mean income uh, is the average income. That means that you, when you sum up all the incomes, then you get equal weight to those who have very high income and that increases the mean relative to the median. So that means that when you compress wages, you raise the income of uh, a majority in the population. And that means that they have a political demand uh, for these normal goods uh, articulated in different ways and sort of captured by the competition of political parties. And this was what happened. And you can see the rise of the welfare state is highest in the areas where, where uh, in areas in the world where differences are the smallest. So this is like a sort of sometimes it's called uh, the Robin Hood paradox. So the welfare state develops where it's least needed because the differences are so small in, initially. But it's again, this misunderstanding that the welfare state is a machinery of redistribution, it isn't. It is a machinery for provision of social goods or public goods or, or, or social policies, social insurance, pensions, uh, Think about all the think about all the big, big, big share of the world's population that have no access to pensions. No, no, they, 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 they have huge implications for their entire life project, uh, their behavior throughout. So this this is what this is what happened. And you see the pattern across countries. That's where where pre pre-tax wages uh, or earnings, labor earnings, are, are most compressed. That is the lowest or pre, lowest or pre-tax inequality. That's where the uh, welfare state is the most generous. So, so, so let us take the argument, cut throat competition generated cooperation, cooperation generated small differences, small differences in the labor market, the big majority of population, uh, generate a political demand for social provisions that uh, we associate with, with welfare spending. But of course it is redistributed, but the main thing is not that. It is redistributed for, because social insurance to the poor is provided on better terms for the poor than for the rich. Social, social insurance for everybody is offered on better terms for the poor than for the rich. In that sense, it is, it is uh, uh, redistributive, but it is redistributive by providing these uh, social uh, goods. I, I, I know that I'm maybe emphasizing this too much, but, but that is because it's so, it's so wrongly understood in many places. And you still have people that talk about this that you, you take from the rich and give to the poor. Initially, that was the policy of the social democratic parties in, uh, in this part of the world. Uh, because they had this socialist uh, uh, starting point, and this was what they were supposed to do, take from the rich and give to the poor. But they saw that that wasn't the popular policy. There wasn't, it wasn't legitimate. What people would like to have was more social provision, more like these things. That I, and then they changed, they changed uh, the policy from targeted program for the, for the poor to universalistic spending for everybody. So child allowances is the same for rich and for poor because it is universalistic or universal spending uh, or that aspect. And, and the welfare state in Northern Europe, the further north you come in Europe, it become more and more universal uh, and, less, and less targeted to specific groups. Targeting is difficult, politically difficult because it's very difficult to sustain a majority behind that policy when it is targeted to a specific group, then it depends very much on the sympathy that you have for that group. So now we have a welfare state, we have insurance. Uh, I try to have logically describe this full circle. How did that affect um, the political behavior uh, 
towards globalization, if you interpret this widely, so the international competition. I, you, again, you can see this pattern throughout the world that when people are well insured, they accept uh, the kind of pressure that you have from international competition. You, you, if you have in surveys of, of people in Scandinavia, uh, normally it's sort of 70% say that uh, globalization is okay. Uh, uh, globalization is, is, is okay, but uh, that small fraction, uh, that fraction should be compared to the huge fraction in, in, uh, in uh, the US that says that it is not okay, even though they are less exposed to international competition, but it is because the lack of social insurance. When you share in the games, of uh, globalization, then globalization, of course, in itself has become more popular. There are gains on average from uh, international trade and global forces uh, having access to all these things. But, but these shares, when you have, a, have sharing institutions like, uh, um, like uh, a welfare state, like a bargaining system in, in wage determination, then you share this more equally, these gains, and then of course it becomes more popular to, to have that kind of, uh, of arrangement. So let, let me now say the full circle here. So then you have international competition, start with that. International competition, global forces, that is either create some sort of cooperation or sustain an initial cooperation in the labor market where you have cooperation between unions, interest organizations in general, that, that they, they, they understand that we have to, we have, we have to cooperate in order to, to tolerate this pressure from outside. We, we, can't have, we can't have some wage development in sheltered industries because that would destroy our competitiveness. Some of these arguments are, are, are very, clean uh, and therefore boring, I guess, uh, uh, economist arguments, but this connection to the social organization is, is very often missed or too little emphasized in my view. This compression generated the support for welfare spending. You see that all over the world, as I said, and in particular in Northern Europe, and that in itself make, uh, uh, how should you say, globalization more acceptable. And that is a full circle. But you could have this on different ways. You could have had very uh, problematic uh, internationalization, the conflicts around that. That means that firms would have been less willing to invest for international markets. Then you would have uh, little coordination because the pressure, then you had much more wage inequality. And then since you have inequality, then the support for welfare standing may be a much more level, lower level. Then the generosity of the welfare state would be lower. With a lower generosity of the welfare state, then you sustain your skepticism towards uh, 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 global forces. So this is that could be different equilibria, as we say in economics, uh, where one with uh, low generosity, high inequality, and, and, and very little acceptance of global forces, and, uh, and the other, as, as we experienced for a very long period, uh, where you had the opposite uh, global competition, small wage differentials, uh, generous welfare states, and then as a consequence, acceptance of the global. Let me say something interesting implications of this. There's a complementarity in my view between capitalist dynamics and I would say socialist values. I'm, I'm using deliberately these words a little bit exaggerated because many of these, those who worked for for the development in, in say, in unions and in, in political parties, they had some views about social values that uh, uh, normally was associated with socialism. And so there seems to be a complementarity that you can combine, you can be, become exploit capitalist dynamics even better uh, by sort of adhering to these equality, security values that are associated with uh, socialism. So this is an important lesson that you have this complementarity between things that people think are uh, contradictory, that they are, you, you, you either have one of these, but not both. But I think both strengthen each other. That means that they are complementary. 
so that's a, I say, an important lesson. I've sort of been a little bit uh, vague how this imp implied, what this implied for innovations and, uh, and investment decisions. Uh, what did capitalists do when they were faced with this uh, lower uh, wage inequality and bigger welfare states, uh, maybe higher taxes and elsewhere? Well, that, maybe it comes as, as a surprise to some of you, but actually this combination of things generated more uh, innovation than uh, in other countries. You see it in the, in the degree of modernization of uh, Northern European countries. They are much, much earlier in, in, in applying modern technology because they are forced to, because they have compressed wages. So that means compressing wages, that means that you introduce a new, uh, a new uh, technology. Well, that, they're going to, there will not be a specific wage in the workforce that work with this modern technology. Why? Because wages are taken out of market competition and placed in this room of collective decision making. That means that wage compression, it works as if you're sort of subsidizing new technologies. Because otherwise, these technologies or these firms that innovate had to pay higher, uh, higher wages because of the higher productivity of the new technology. This you break this line, and that means that it is work as a subsidy on modern technology. At the same time, it is a tax, as if it was a tax on all technologies, because we have raised the bottom wages. We have raised the bottom wages. Uh, so much that um, uh, uh, that you can't use old technology. Why are there such a huge difference between the most modern and the least modern technology in a country like India? Well, it's because we ex or Indians accept this huge difference in earnings between those who work in the IT industry, which is effective and operating in India, and those who run with a sort of uh, with their muscles in, in transportation with a rickshaw. So you accept this huge span. Of course, that couldn't be possible in Belgium. Why? Because in Belgium, there's nobody will work for a wage that will allow a rickshaw to be profitable. So this is the picture you should have in mind, that compression wages that, that leads to uh, a lot of scrapping of old obsolete technologies and the invitation of modern technologies, because the modern technologies, they are more profitable here with high average wages, but a wage that is not tied to their specific, uh, to their specific uh, uh, technology uh, in use. So what, why should we be afraid that this uh, heaven on earth, uh, as uh, maybe I have described it as, that this should dissolve? Well, there, there's one thing that I think is, there are many things that's threatening. But one major thing is that the combination of small differences in the labor force, wage compression, combined with full employment, what does that mean? It means higher profits. It's, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's this very, very simple logic. Uh, here's one way you can think about it, how it works. When you, when you wait, it's not exactly the way it, it is done, but it's one easy picture to have in mind. When you, when you lower the high wages, then profits go up because wages, the high, the high wages will go down. That means that you invest more. There's more profitable now to invest. The, the, it creates profits at moderating the high wages. Well, when you invest more, then the demand for, for labor goes up because you have to produce these things. So you have to implement them as even they are labor saving all in all the scale expands. So that means that you can raise the bottom wages without creating unemployment. So this is why uh, this is why the process of creative destruction, as uh, Josef Schumpeter called it, it speeds up uh, with wage equality, but it is also one aspect of it that total profits go up. And if, if this, before it used to be that <coughs> union leaders and so on, they talked about, they talked about uh, um, profits as a, so retained savings in the company, 
that the unions actually controlled because they could always control the wage setting, but they wanted to retain some profits in the enterprise so that the enterprise could expand and innovate even more, uh, have a more modern economy, uh, uh, still more modern, uh, even more modern economy than they had in, in the outset. And uh, for a long time, it worked like that. But uh, as, as you sort of expanded um, the system, then you come, more people became uh, in this position that they could get a share of these uh, company profits, uh, also those who were retained. So here's a, here's a scaring picture. If you take the retained profits in, uh, in the Norwegian companies, and say that these are controlled by the present owner. You distribute it, we can distribute that out from the present owner because we have very good data in Norway, register data that, that tells you exactly that how this is done. Then you raise the top share of income to the capital, to the, the richest 1%, basically capital owners, from uh, say 12% uh, that goes to the top to 20%. And that is the same level as in the US. So that means that some of the cost here, unless you control it, control this uh, upper class, that goes a major part of, of, of the benefits goes to an upper class. And of course that won't be tolerated for a long time by those who sort of moderate their own wages in the name of solidarity uh, for uh, uh, other groups. So this, this is one important tension in the system. The last thing I'm gonna say that, in a sense, many countries, this is true for, but, but in a sense, uh, the Northern European countries are victims of their own success. What does that mean? Well, they have developed fairly well with the uh, compression of wages, innovation, modernization of the economy. For example, the distance between the most productive enterprise and the least productive enterprise in operation is much closer here a sign of modernization, I would say, uh, than in the US, for example, or not to speak about India. If you take India, then there's, there's a huge difference that if you have to multiply by thousands to, to get the gap between the most productive industry, the IT industry, and the rickshaws, for example, that I mentioned early on. So this, but, but here, uh, many, many people thought for a long time that this distance between most productive and least productive was most, uh, was, was sort of most narrow in the US, but in Northern European countries, it, it is actually uh, it, uh, significantly uh, less than, than the US. And, and that in itself is, is, is interesting. Uh, so my last point is to say that under this process, you have to understand that you can mechanize commodity production much more than you can mechanize service production. And that means that more and more people end up in, in industries that are sheltered against competition in the, in the global market. And then it's much more difficult to sort of ask for the general support of these people because they are the, the fraction of, of the workforce that work in the exposed industries is declining over time. And, and that is a major tension to it. Something that we should think about for all the sustainable goals that you have to have, you have to have a balanced, uh, a balance between winners and losers. If those who sort of kept down in the name of solidarity uh, in, in the, is the majority and they feel that this is the case while this tiny small group of top income earners go away with 20% of, of, of the gains created, then I think people, ask question uh, whether this, this, this development is, uh, is uh, fair. I see around me now there are some uh, impatience to get to some questions and so on. Uh, so without further ado, I, I open for questions and, and comments and so on. I'm very happy to try to answer. Thank you, Kalle. This was really, really interesting and we have we have so sorry. Uh, so we have received several uh, good questions, and uh, before and I will take them in the order of the questions. But I just want to use this opportunity uh, to 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 raise one concern that I think many listeners are thinking about, and that's the fact that we see a weakening of dem democratic functions around the world. We see more autocratic leaders, and not all countries. 
uh, people in, in around the world cannot necessarily benefit from the lessons from the Nordic region because there is an elite with a grip on power in some countries and uh, and and what is your what is the lesson for them well how can they benefit from labor unions will they have to rely on international labor unions to to reach uh, this uh, nordic model and and a further question is is this important because what we see now is that the autocratic leaders are not are not only they are also promoting growth and and development to some extent it's just that they do not support democracy to the same extent what are the lessons for those countries it's very difficult to be brief but i have to be brief uh, i i think uh, what you say is, is well taken first of all i'm not advocating that they should take anything similar to the nordic model or whatever it is i think they should learn without imitating and and for example the country that have a very similar development to sweden is south korea with very different uh, institutions. They had sort of subsidized education, they had subsidized some investment and so on, but they had a similar impact. So that they just they had wage compression, they had a huge expansion. So this is, uh, this is Swedish experiences with different means. Uh, so back to authoritarian rule, uh, South Korea was also authoritarian uh, under General Parker, and this, this happened. Uh, the authoritarian is, I think is, is inward looking and we have to remember that most crises in the world make uh, um, it is the exception that you get the kind of response that you got in in the US during the New Deal in the 1930s and in Scandinavia with the social uh, dem democratic mobilization uh, that was the exception the, the, the typical thing was fascism. It was fascism throughout uh, European countries. Uh, you can mention all the most well-known, of course, is uh, Germany, Italy, uh, Portugal, Greek. Uh, uh, many of these countries became Spain, uh, became very involved-looking, authoritarian rule, anti-democratic. But also Latin America became the same. Latin America became exactly the same as a response to the crisis, involved-looking, uh, less uh, democratic. So, so I think it's, it's related to the first uh, thing I mentioned that cutthroat competition can, can generate cooperation, but it doesn't necessarily do it. It can also create a reaction that is, uh, uh, is more reactionary, authoritarian and so on. India has a very, uh, has a very uh, authoritarian leader these days, uh, Modi. And, uh, the, uh, uh, the Hindu nationalism in, in, in India, I think, is a big threat to the Muslims in India and then to other groups as well, that more violence. So I, I share all these things. The, of course, that's not the recipe. What they can learn from the Nordic countries is that countries that had conflicts initially can emerge uh, much better without these conflicts. Collaboration can be good. That is what, what people can learn. So people uh, that, can, that, can, that can be equally relevant uh, in South uh, Africa as in India, as in Sweden. And, and, and also that equality in itself is not the break on development. Maybe it is the positive development. And now let's go to Romania, because there is a question from Diana Haydn, and she says, my PhD thesis is about literacy in Romanian rural areas. I want to demonstrate that responsibility can be shifted from the administration to the community through a tool called tax shifting. This tool has only been used in public health. If you know the case of Romania, you should know that any intervention of the government to improve the quality of life of the child living in village has fa failed. One out of four kids are illiterate with low chance of succeeding as adults. Do you think tax task shifting could be a sustainable development strategy to lead to increased literacy in disadvantaged environments and could be extended internationally? Uh, that was a great question. Um, uh, I would not have any details uh, from Romania. I know uh, other countries much better, but I trust exactly what you, you said um for for this i think it's for any progressive policy it has to have a power support from below 
first then it can be controlled the implementation of the policy can be controlled this is what happened for, on a broad scale in northern european countries and you see it also in uh, i just take a related question to uh, the study sort of health policies in india uh we is on those uh, uh chelsea uh, and uh, and Laura van der Walle. We have three persons already. In a huge experiment uh, that been done in, in India, in the sense that they changed just the, 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 the district of elections. So then we could see the impact of changing some of these things on child mortality. So here's the short lesson what we what we found. That changing this, then we see that inequality, inequality kills. Inequality means that less children survive uh, the first two years. Uh, and the basic mechanism is the social provision, because there's less participation, just as uh, the, quest, the one who raised the question emphasized, there's less control uh, locally of, of the policy. But if you have political competition at the local level, then it eliminates this bad effect of inequality. And these things, I think, are, are fairly, uh, we have seen it in other countries as well, but they are fairly generalizable uh, conclusions that inequality kills, but political competition uh, reduced the bad impact of inequality. And now uh, Aaron asks uh, if we can have Professor Mona's view on what Jason Hickel calls the dark side of the Nordic model. And that refers to how the Nordic countries have some of the highest levels of resource use and CO2 emissions in the world in consumption based terms, drastically overshooting safe planetary boundaries. Uh, yes, they generate more renewable energy than most countries, but these gains are wiped out by carbon intensive imports. If Scandinavia's luxury comes at the expense of the world's most vulnerable, how can we adjust the political economy of the model to make it globally just and sustainable? So I, I, I don't mean that it may make the model just and sustainable. I would like to emphasize certain experiences that people can alter and change and implement if they like in, in other contexts, but not doing exactly as we have done. And it is quite right, we have a dark side. Norway is, is uh, one of the worst countries in this respect that we, we produce, uh, we take up oil and, uh, and we sort of kind of uh, proud of that. I would think that the measure of the, of the imprint of the different countries have should be measured by the consumption. If you, if you look around the world for, for the CO2 content in, in the consumption for different groups in the world, and then it's quite clear that it's clearly associated with inequality. So the big polluters in the world, they are the super rich in the US measured by how much CO2 they emission by their own consumption patterns. When they come to consumption patterns in the Nordic countries, they are not, they are not the best performers, but they, they are better in the consumption than they are in the production. And I think it's, it is important to measure it on the consumption side, because that's where you can make people responsible for it. Even though I think uh, I think it, there should be political pressure here to limit uh, uh, oil production and, and uh, finding new oil fields in the, in the North Sea. But that's uh, the basic answer to the question is that, uh, first of all, I don't accept the premise because we, I, I'm not agitating for, for exporting anything from, from this part of the world to the rest of the world. I'm, I'm sort of saying that we have to tell each other what the experiences are in different parts of the world, then we become wiser, not more stupid. And we have more questions. So here from uh, you, uh, Julia Brun Björkheim, she says, uh, since you argue that the exposure to com competition has led to cooperation nationally with compressed wages, what's your take on the race to the bottom of corporate income tax rates? Yeah, that is an uh, important uh, question. Uh, first of all, there is a race to the bottom, but, but uh, as you see that there is some countries try to to uh, to limit it by setting sort of international standards and this is international cooperation is necessary for this they, they, I'm, I'm not again i'm not advocating that experiences for the northern europe should solve the world's problems but but here are some of the experience we have and so then other people's coming from different places 
come with your experiences and we can learn from both together. I think the race to the bottom is a little bit exaggerated. It's also exaggerated that, um, uh, that the, the harmful effect of taxes. Uh, for example, you should think that the high taxes that used to be the case, average taxes used to be the case in Scandinavian countries should hamper economic development all in all. It had the opposite effect. Uh, that said, we have to re remind each other that uh, the, the country to the highest marginal taxes after the Second World War was the US. They had much higher marginal tax rates uh, on income than, than Sweden, Denmark and Norway ever had had. So, so that that country that, uh, that many people think is the most sort of competitive country, I don't think so, but, but many people think that, they had for a long time the highest uh, wages. Uh, there is a pressure to lower taxes, but it's not as strong as many people think. Sometimes it's used an ex as an excuse by politicians uh, that don't like high taxes in the South. And we have one final question, uh, and that is uh, from Humshan. How does global competition change employment aspects in public sector? How can we manage the wage gap between employees in private enterprises and government sector? Well, it's a, this is very difficult uh, question to or have a general answer on, because in some countries, uh, then the public sector has the lowest wages and uh, the private sector has higher wages. In, in, in other countries, it's opposite. Uh, that's, so it's, it's a very mixed uh, experiences. Africa, for example, has uh, a labor surplus inside the public sector because you can, you can get more access to, to rents and, uh, uh, and extra income by, by being a, a public employed other countries this is uh, for example in uh, scandinavia uh, the wage level in general in 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 the public sector is lower but uh, but security job security is higher so maybe you get something that you that you won't uh, get otherwise if you take this model that i said uh, that the cutthroat competition internationally should uh, lead to the control of, of wage setting in other sectors, then the public sector will be one typical example. And uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that, uh, that uh, even though that uh, some aspect of the public sector in Scandinavia, I think uh, health provision and some types of, uh, some other types, uh, but then with, with jobs with lower skill that they are underpaid, uh, we saw that very clear, clearly on the Corona crisis that those who did the major job had the lowest pay. Uh, I, I think that is a, a pro problem, but it has it has to be raised as a problem and discussed as a problem. In for the present uh, in Norway, there's a strike uh, among public uh, workers, uh, and they they strike to change the relative wages. Of course, they would like to be upgraded, uh, and I good reasons to, they have good arguments in favor of their case. I, I think it is possible to do these things, but again, it is, uh, it is open, you have to be, you have to be open in this, it is sort of, you have to be socially organized in order to get weight to these uh, arguments and understand that a lot of wealth creation happens in the public sector. If you take the whole health sector, for example, it's, it's the most productive sector in the economy. And many people speak as if they are just using the value created in the private sector. It's just turned around. So we have to emphasize the real productivity of different sectors and many public activities are highly productive and should also be rewarded as that. Well, thank you very much. And we had this speech for for students who are PhD candidates and young researchers. And I think your speech also shows the value of, of being a, a motivated by normative political questions and at the same time doing useful research. Do you have any advice for researchers who aspire to, to, to balance these uh, <laughs> ideals? Yep, I uh, uh, have an opinion about these things. I think people are doing a big mistake. The most interesting questions in the world are ideological questions. 
that they are they are raised by interest they are raised uh, there's a concern for certain things and these are very often connected to uh, how we understand that the world uh, that the world works so the the questions are ideological but the answers can't be ideological the answers can must be impartial they may, must be they must uh, follow the best methods but it's very often the opposite that they are so afraid for for the ideological questions they never they are never raised and as a consequence the, those answers you come with they become ideological because you're not raising the interesting issues so i think it's much more important to raise ideological questions but be quite clear that that uh, the answers must be impartial they must be objective there must be something that can be challenged by others and so on that that doesn't make the answers ideological they make the answers more objective but they can be answers on ideological questions good luck thank you very much